Let's talk tuna for a second because everyone wants to bag on it. I eat a fair bit of tuna and I think that tuna is a tremendous protein on keto and I want to address one thing right out in the open. We are going to dive into the whole mercury conversation with tuna and I'm not saying that mercury is fine. Do not get me wrong. Tuna does contain mercury, but we also have to look at the big picture with some of the newer research coming out in the world of selenium and how selenium affects mercury, but also the source of tuna and what kind of tuna you are utilizing. Okay, first thing I want to touch on, when we bag on tuna, we have to equally be prepared to bag on other meats as well, right? Okay, tuna contains mercury and our body has to deal with it, okay, but beef and pork and lamb and bison, well, those meats contain what's called new 5GC, which is a sugar that our body has to deal with and our body can potentially have an inflammatory response with. It's not in the same category as mercury. The point is, if you're prepared to bag on tuna, you also have to be prepared to bag on other meats as well because there's always an argument. And I've had to defend tuna for a very long time because people see me eating it. They see it in my Instagram videos and they, they question if I'm concerned about mercury and whatnot. So anyhow, let's break it down if it is a true good protein on keto. So when it comes down to protein quality, Tuna, in my opinion, is one of the best that is out there. Okay, so when you actually look at the dry weight of tuna, it is between 82 and 84% protein by dry weight. Okay, and 44 to 45% of that is essential amino acid protein dry weight, meaning it has a very high concentration of essential amino acids. The essential amino acids are the actual aminos that are allowing us to build protein, allowing us to build muscle, okay? We're talking namely things like leucine that trigger that mTOR response, that allow us to potentially build muscle, that allow us to recover. Okay, so from a protein perspective, yes, absolutely, hands down, it is a phenomenal protein. But we also have to look at the vitamin D content, right? Like, I'm a huge fan of sardines, I'm a huge fan of anchovies, I'm a huge fan of getting vitamin D from eggs, okay? But when you're looking at like sardines and anchovies, you're typically consuming the bone and you're consuming the skin, which is fine. And that's how you're getting that vitamin D content up so high. People forget that tuna has a very high vitamin D level just in the meat itself, okay? So you're looking at like 270-ish IUs of vitamin D in a three ounce serving of tuna. Okay, and that's a bioavailable vitamin D. That's not D that has to go through a conversion process. That's a bioavailable vitamin D3 that your body can utilize. Okay, so we've got that working for us. But then we have the selenium piece. We're talking 200 plus percent of your daily allotment of selenium in a three to three and a half ounce serving of tuna. Okay, this is so imperative when it comes down to thyroid function. It is one of the most important minerals that we could possibly have. Okay, but let's forget the minerals for a second. Let's talk vitamin B. Okay, when you are doing keto, it is not always easy to get the veggies that you need. It's not always easy to get the vitamin B that you need. Specifically, when we're looking at vitamin B3 or niacin, Okay, when we look at what is called the niacinamide pathway, when we look at this sort of recycling pathway that has to do with what's called NAD production in the body, niacin is very important. Okay, so when it comes down to cellular respiration and our body being able to create energy, if we do not have niacin available, it's very difficult to recycle NAD and ultimately create energy. I'm gonna not go down that crazy rabbit hole for a minute, but the point is, it's very important. Same with vitamin B12. We potentially lose a lot more B vitamins on a lower carb protocol because our kidneys are expelling more water because our insulin levels are lower. So it becomes even more important to replenish that. So when you're looking at 100%, 111% of your daily value when it comes down to vitamin B12, bottom line is you're getting some pretty darn good micronutrients out of tuna itself. We're gonna jump into the all important mercury conversation for a second because this is very important. First thing I wanna show you, look at the chart that's on the screen right now. Okay, look at skipjack tuna. Okay, skipjack tuna, we're talking like 12 micrograms or so mercury, okay, in a serving. Okay, when we look at like big eye tuna in like a big filet, we're talking closer to 60 micrograms of mercury. Tuna is not all created equal. The kind of tuna that you get, how the tuna is sourced, where it's coming from, that all plays a very important role as well. Now, if you base upon what the EPA has suggested, where they say about one microgram of mercury is okay per kilogram of body weight, even by that standard, it still shows that you could easily have some skipjack tuna daily and not really be running into an issue here. 
but I want to be able to share some pretty compelling new evidence talking about selenium and mercury. Now, it's all in a lot of ways hypothetical because nothing has been taken to the bank yet, but we're seeing how this mechanism works. I will say, if you want to try some of the tuna that I recommend, I've always been a big fan of Wild Planet, and they have, down below, I put a link to them, you can get it through Thrive Market. They have two different kinds that I really like. They have skipjack tuna in a glass jar with high quality olive oil. It is these really thick filet cuts that is like, it's not like eating tuna out of a can. It is like thick, good, clean cuts and it's delicious. So they are a big supporter on this channel. Thrive Market's been a big supporter on this channel. Wild Planet has been a supporter on this channel for years. Definitely recommend you check them out. They are 100% pole and line caught or troll caught. So they never use any nets, nothing like that. And they're using good quality olive oil oil as well. So for me, it ends up being like, I'll even use it as a meal replacement because I'm getting enough fat from the good quality olive oil. I'm getting the protein that I need. I'm getting the aminos that I need. And I'm also getting the DHA. So one serving, just one can has 204 milligrams of DHA, docosahexaenoic acid. That's the omega-3 that I always talk about for the brain and everything like that. So definitely recommend you check them out. They also have something called Petite Tono, which is a little bit more of a rich flavor. So if you wanted to use that, uh, even like a more of a culinary setting, I would highly recommend that. But I'm a huge fan of the Skipjack. The Skipjack is my jam, plus it's that lower mercury content that I'm really after. So that link is down below. Again, you can check them out through Thrive Market. You will save 25% off of your order and get that free gift as well. So check them out down below in the description. So here's the deal with tuna. It's a predatory fish, so it's consuming smaller fish, which means that it's building up mercury levels, okay? That's commonly known. When we digest mercury, there's really two fates. It goes to our liver, okay, and it binds with glutathione, and it kind of goes through a process, and it can either go to the bile or it can go into the blood. If it goes into the bile, it either gets reabsorbed or it gets excreted. If it goes to the blood, then it travels to the kidney. And when it travels to the kidney, it binds to something else. So when it travels to the kidneys, it binds with another component where it ends up turning it into a non-toxic form. Now, here's the big disclaimer. As long as the rate of mercury consumption is low enough where the kidneys can handle it and bind it and turn it into this non-toxic form, everything is fine. It's when the intake of mercury exceeds what the kidneys can handle, assuming that the liver and that whole binding aspect ended up going to the blood and not the bile, that's when you run into a problem. But there's something super important. Remember how I mentioned that tuna was very high in selenium? Okay, well, it turns out that selenium has an exceptionally high affinity for mercury and vice versa. So selenium has an antioxidant in it called selenine. Okay, now this antioxidant, like I said, it binds to the mercury itself. And this whole process may actually change the composition of mercury in not just the tuna's body, but in the human body as well. See, selenium binds to these specific amino acids called selenoproteins, okay? Now in the tuna, the tuna is using these selenoproteins to protect red blood cells. Okay, so in essence, what's potentially happening here is because the mercury content of tuna is just naturally higher, the tuna have sort of the potential built-in mechanism to deal with it better. That's why maybe selenium is so high in tuna. Now what's wild is that mercury binds to selenium a million times more than its next affinity. Okay, so the next thing that it would bind to would be sulfur and it binds to selenium a million times more than it does to sulfur, which tells us again that mercury has this huge affinity for selenium. So we are dealing with a very kind of a natural pairing there that could be making it so that the mercury we get from tuna isn't as big of an issue as we potentially think. Now again, I'm not taking this all the way to the bank. We're looking at preliminary research here, but it's kind of funny how things naturally sort of work together. I still think at the end of the day, if you follow kind of what the EPA has set out in terms of how many micrograms of mercury you really take in, you're in a much better position, right? Obviously, we don't want to be taking in lots and lots of mercury, but we also have to look at the big equation here and what's happening with other minerals being factored in, okay? So you have all these risks that are associated with red meat, with lamb, with pork, with this. You have different risks that are associated with different kinds of fish, different risks associated with different kinds of tuna. Okay, you have to kind of weigh your own risks 
and do your own due diligence here. I still continue to eat tuna. I still usually eat at least like one can or one jar, usually per day. So at the end of the day, it works well for me. I like the protein content. I like the Mediterranean feel, and I feel like the benefits for me outweigh the risk, but I'm also not eating a dump truck full of it. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow, and don't forget to check out Wild Planet down below.